last year when most investors were watching their stocks plummet. One Wall Street legend had an unfair advantage. He was identifying winning stocks with massive uptrends, like Riot Blockchain before it shot up 10,000%, Digital Turbine before it shot up 789%, Overstock.com before it shot up 1,000%. This power gauge comes from the legendary Mark Chaikin. Right now, you can get a free in-depth look at how his power gauge system works, a way to type in any of the 4,000 different tickers and see exactly where a stock is most likely to go next in any type of market. Simply go to chakentrial.com for your free look. Again, that's chakentrial.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is Thursday, July 14th, 2022. Beautiful day down here in South Florida, and we have a great interview coming up. We have Med Faber. Uh, he's of the Cambria Funds. Uh, you've probably heard of him. He's got the Med Faber Show, a great podcast. The guy's been in the industry for a long time. I've known him over a decade. I will say, honestly, one of the smartest, nicest people in the industry. And lucky enough to have him on the show today. We're going to talk about what he thinks is going to happen after one of the worst six months to start the year. We may, may not be on the same page. But then also, Meb's one of the best experts when it comes to investing overseas. Talks about the opportunities in emerging markets. And he tells you the one investment, if he was stuck on an island for 10 years, what he'd invest in right now. All that and more coming up right now with Meb Faber and his great interview. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Another great interview here for our show, Thursday, the 14th of July, 2022. And uh, it's a guest I had on several years ago, my old podcast, and great to have him back on, uh, Mib Faber. And it's a guy that I've followed for many, many years, probably over a decade. Give you a little bit about him. He's a co-founder and chief investment officer of uh, Cambria Investment Management. He's a manager of Cambria's ETFs. Uh, and separate accounts. Uh, he is the um, author of several uh, leather-bound books. He's a host of the Meb Faber podcast, uh, Ben Faber Show podcast, which is great. I listen to all the time. He's also a frequent speaker uh, on investment strategies. He's been in Barron's, New York Times, New Yorker, you name it. He graduated from University of Virginia, a Cavalier with a double major in engineering science and biology. Thanks so much for joining us, Meb. Great to be here, guys. So, Meb, you know, Let's talk about kind of the, the, the elephant in the room right now, the big picture stuff, uh, the fact that we're in a bear market, uh, the fact that a lot of uh, experts I follow that I believe in are calling for a recession. How are you viewing it right now after one of the worst first six months ever in a, a stock market to start a year? Well, um, I hate to be Debbie Downer because you and I started chatting before the show and, and we're optimists at heart. And so we'll... we'll finish this on a, a really optimistic note. I promise we'll get to the, the really optimistic side, but we'll start with the, the pessimistic stuff. Um, U.S. stocks, I think, are, are in uh, what we like to call the dark quadrant or kind of a world of pain, which is if you go back 100 plus years, so I'm a quant. We love to study historical uh, timeline and, and histories to, to give us a guide for the future with the knowledge it's always going to be different. And if you just bucket simply U.S. stocks, cheap and expensive, we like to use 10-year P.E. ratios, but you can really use anything. Valuations are really a blunt tool. And if you're in an area where a market's really expensive or really cheap, they should all say the same thing. So it doesn't matter if you use cash flow, sales, whatever, usually puts you in the right galaxy. Um, and so cheap, expensive, and then uptrend or downtrend. Well, historically, the best warm and fuzzy place to be, to be is a cheap uptrend, not surprisingly. Um, but second best, surprisingly to me, is an expensive uptrend. So stocks that are expensive getting more expensive but going up. And that's where we were for a few years, really. Um, and that all started to end really in 2020, 2021. You had the kind of culmination craziness in 2021 with retail, the meme stocks, SPACs, IPOs, option trading, on and on and on. Um, and a lot of those stocks are now down 60, 80 plus percent. So some of the froth in that part is, has come off. However, if you look at the broad U.S. stock market, 
uh, it's still pretty expensive. So the, the metric we use, the 10-year PE ratio, hit a peak of 40. Now, the good news is after this decline, it's down to 30. The bad news is historically that sits usually around 20. Um, and the big problem right now is inflation. And so historically, you know, no one really has dealt with inflation except for the the no hair, gray hairs, right? I mean, it's been, <laughs> what, 30 plus years of just declining interest rates, lowered inflation, and all of a sudden, wham, inflation's at like 8%. So stock market valuations are already on average lower in low inflation times. So let's call it around 20. Remember, we're at 30. If inflation's high, and really the kink happens above 4%, and it gets worse exponentially at six, eight, on and on, traditional valuation metrics, the P uh, ratio is down to the low teens. That's a long way from here. Now, so again, I, I don't want to be the Debbie, do, De, Debbie Downer, but the simple um, summary to your, to your question is U.S. stocks look very vulnerable. Uh, bonds, which historically people expect to help, they don't always. And so you can't really count on them, particularly from a super low interest rate environment. They should help on average, but but they haven't this year. And so um, you have this sort of uncomfortable environment that's sort of a nightmare scenario for a lot of institutions, pension funds, and individuals too, particularly the older cohort. Um, the silver lining there is I think value stocks will do just fine. We have one of the largest value spreads ever between cheap and expensive within the U.S. So if you buy value companies, you'll you'll do okay, I think. Whatever you do, stay away from the really expensive. And there's still crazy expensive stocks, oddly enough. But there's other pockets of opportunity elsewhere outside of our borders and on and on. But that's the that's the short uh, short answer to your question is it uh, it could be dark times. I'm I'm part southern, so the old uh, phrase sell in May go away. I, we we've been saying uh, sell in May and see y'all in the fall. So uh, we we think. Um, <laughs> Right now, that, that flipping from expensive uptrend to expensive downtrend, which happened this year, uh, puts you in a, in a, not, a, not a warm and fuzzy place. So let me ask you, you, you talk, uh, you know, growth versus value. Obviously, growth outperformed for many, many years. You're seeing value stocks outperform now. And, you know, historically, you will see that shift. You know, it, it's been a long run for growth. I, you know, I can't argue. I'm a growth investor, but it's been a long run. Mm -hmm. But I look at some stocks that, that were high flying growth stocks at one point, like let's say PayPal, for example, has a four P ratio below 15. Meta, old Facebook, around 12 and a half PE. So would you consider them now value plays down here? When it, I mean, you don't have to mention specific stocks, but when yeah. you see some of these growth stocks come down and the P ratios are at some of the lowest levels ever, could those be in a value basket at that point? Sure. You know, I mean, look, okay. let me give you a good example. Um, or let me give you a bad example first and then a good example after. But, you know, we, we held Apple. We have my largest fund to shareholder yield ETF. Um, it's been around since 2013. That fund, it's, it's one of its longest and largest positions was Apple. I mean, it held it from 2013 to 2021. Or we sold it recently. I think it was actually in 2022. And simply, I mean, a lot of people consider that, of course, a growth stock, but it, it was cheap and then eventually got expensive. Um, so like, it's like Buffett says, and everyone you know understands, like value growth, two sides of the same coin. You can't really look at it and ignore one side. It doesn't make a lot of sense. People love to try to bucket growth and value, but um, there's nothing more that we would love that to see a lot of sectors that are traditionally high growth, like tech, um, be populated throughout the uh, value category. And so we actually have seen that a lot in emerging markets. You're seeing tech is one of the largest allocations for us, but it's not in the US, it's in, in emerging. Um, but another example that I think is interesting, just kind of going to show how some of these sectors go in and out of favor on value and growth. I mean, look at uh, energy. I mean, energy is a, is a sector peaked at, I think, a third of the S&P 500, just a massive percentage of the stock market. And then like a year or two, a couple of years ago, it bottomed at 2%. 2% of the entire stock market was energy. And so it went from loved growth you know, market to hated. Absolutely no one wanted to touch it. Oil futures trading negative. And then here we are and energy's done great. Um, well, <laughs> at least up till recently. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's a day in the sun, a day in the shade for all of these, right? And so um, there's nothing I would love more to see than a lot of the growthy names get 
uh, cheap and, and to have areas where you, you allocate to them. And, and the momentum plays in there too. But um, we like to say we're agnostic. You know, uh, we asset class agnostic. It's hard to do. Uh, security agnostic. Um, and, uh, and to really look for opportunity wherever it may be. Yeah, so that's a good point because, you know, a lot of these, these tech stocks, and we'll talk about emerging markets in a moment, but, you know, a lot of these tech stocks, you, you hear, I hear a lot in the media that it's over. It's over for tech. It's over for innovation. And it just doesn't ring with me because if innovation's over, then the world's kind of over. I mean, yet we continue to innovate. We've innovated through a lot worse times and we continue. So I would love, I agree, there, there's um, a lot of great. Sorry. But. Let me let me chime in on, on just a comment there. You know, I think... Um, you get some of the best companies founded during bear markets. If you look at Google, you look at Uber, like those companies started in the, you know, the wreckage of the Internet bubble or global financial crisis. Um, you have times when, you know, a lot of the greatest builders are innovating. So you always have to you hear the, the news flow in the media. It's always negative, but distinguishing between a company and a stock, you know, you go back to 2000 mm -hmm. and a lot of these great companies, Cisco, Microsoft, uh, their stocks just got too expensive. The companies mm -hmm. uh, continue to excel and grow for 10, 20 years. But sometimes those stocks just didn't go anywhere because they just got too expensive. And so you always have to distinguish between the company and the stock. And so you have scenarios. It's, it's, the media always loves to paint, hey, you know, the, the market as a whole or stocks as a whole, but there's always going to be opportunity. Right. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, th this is the most uh, innovative and exciting time in history. You know, I mean, look, we were just this morning starting to get these images from the new uh, telescope oh, yeah. from NASA. I mean, come on. How do you not get excited? But, but a good point. <laughs> and this, sorry to ramble here, but talking about security selection is we wrote a blog post called The Journey to 100X, where we talked about sort of my angel investing journey and I've invested, I think in over 320 startups in the past decade. And there's such a huge um, difference between public market investing, which is just day to day, just negativity. You're just getting smashed on the head on, on CNBC and in the wall street journal with negativity, geopolitics, my God, Twitter. And then on the flip side is looking at a lot of startups. So I've reviewed something like 7,000 startups at this point. And every single one, the founders are trying to change the world and these innovative technologies and they're doing cool things. And it's like the most optimistic, you know, separation. Now, you're both just investing in businesses, right? One just happens yeah. to be publicly <laughs> traded and one happens to be private. But there's a huge mental difference in the two. Um, so I found uh, a nice balance there because public markets can be uh, can be really depressing and rough, whereas a lot of the earlier stage private can be uh, very refreshing. Yeah, the, the great thing is about private investing, you don't have that news flow coming out like you do with a publicly traded company. You don't have a quarterly report that you have to put out. You don't have news releases. You don't have analysts trying to beat you down on Twitter, wherever it might be, uh, and have a price fluctuate just based on nonsense sometimes. It's just on sediment. It doesn't necessarily have to do with the, the value of the company. And you can't sell it. <laughs> That's exactly. a huge one, right? Is you can't log into Robinhood or E-Trade and yeah. hit sell. You're stuck with that sucker for three, five, ten years, maybe forever, which I think yeah. is a big benefit. I used to think illiquidity was a negative, and now the more uh, I chat with investors, we have over 100,000 investors at Cambria, and uh, the more I chat with investors, the more I think that um, having the illiquidity handcuffs is a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah, especially for, I think, the retail investor who sometimes will let their emotions take control of a decision and base it off something they heard or read in, read in the Wall Street Journal. You know, I always like to use an analogy of your home. Imagine if you, your home was priced like a stock. I mean, the value of your home would be going up and down. You, you and your wife would be arguing, oh, my, we got to sell our home now. It's up. Oh, my God, it's down. We got to get out. I mean, it would, you would go crazy if you knew the value of your home every single day. Um, so, yeah, I think it's great yeah. that people can't, you know, when it comes to private investing. You talked real quick again. I'm talking about emerging markets, but one one last question before we get in there. You talked about um, you know in, in the fall, uh, you know, looking potentially if the market is coming down, maybe potentially valuations come in line, create some more opportunity. I'll talk about the Fed real quick. Do you see the Fed at some point, whether it be later this year, get to the level where inflation gets under control, and maybe they start kind of turning back their you know their dial for pushing up interest rates? That could be a bit of a catalyst for the market coinciding with valuations coming down? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, the hardest job anyone has on picking out the path of future interest rates and inflation, it's so hard. Um, there's nothing I'd love more to see in, in inflation moderate, and hopefully it does, uh, even down at 4%. Yeah. Gas is seven bucks here in LA, so uh, it's it's uh, it's close close to my heart. Um, the short answer is I don't know. That would be an, that would be a great scenario if if things sort of um, mellow out. You know, the challenge always is again separating that macro from what's going on with the stocks. And so, um, in any scenario, you know, I think. Um, having a plan and having it set up ahead of time is the key to all this. You know, most investors don't, and they kind of wing it, which I think is, is really unfortunate because it gets to the emotional side that you mentioned, which is where the fractures occur, where people uh, don't know what to do. And they usually in that scenario do something dumb, right? Emotional. And so coming up with a plan about whatever's going to happen in the fall. So interest rates come down, inflation comes down, fed moderates, stocks rip. Let me give you a good example. In 2020 and in March, I wrote an article. It was called Investing in the Time of Coronavirus. And I laid out two scenarios, one bullish, one bearish. I said, look, it's impossible to handicap at this point what's going to happen. Zombie apocalypse or we figure this out. Governments uh, cooperate. Healthcare fixes this. And we're at new highs by the end of the summer. And to be able to hold those two potential outcomes in your head and not go crazy, I think, is really important, you know, and, yeah. and, and similar thing now is like, are you prepared for a scenario where stocks could go down 50% from here? And most are not. Are mm -hmm. you prepared for a scenario where stocks rip right back up and are at new highs by the end of the year? Most are not, right? I mean, are, if you were to say earlier in the year, are you prepared or a year ago, are you prepared for 8% inflation? People would be like, are you crazy? Yeah. Uh, you know, most are not. And then, you know, on and on, you do like these scenarios. And so, the challenge I think for most people is if you don't have sort of a written framework for how to think about what you're going to do, you're just flying blind. And my gosh, like what a, I, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And so coming up with a broad based plan, I, we pull on Twitter all the time and ask people, do you have a written plan? It's like 90% plus say no. Yeah. So uh, I think coming up with something to, game plan, whatever outcome is possible, I think is really important. So what, what's going to happen this fall? I don't know. We like to say that yeah. it's better to be uh, Rip Van Winkle as an investor than Nostradamus, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but you got to be prepared for either, you know, uh, either scenario. Yeah. And, and this year, by the way, is, is yeah. a scenario that the vast majority of institutions are not prepared for. The stocks and bonds both down is really a nightmare scenario for them. And, and even though th this would be a top five Worst year ever for sixty forty if it closed today, but what most people and that's we're down I don't know what twelve percent or something. Yeah. Uh, but what most people don't understand is that it can get way worse. Like his historical sixty forty drawdown is well over fifty percent. So um, you know, it, it, putting it in context, I think is important the history side, but uh, it doesn't make it any easier. All right, so let's get out of the U.S. because I want to. I'm starting to get depressed over here. Let's move overseas, and uh, I know you're a big uh, believer in emerging markets. How do you see them right now? Do you see some opportunities? I know you mentioned technology overseas uh, emerging markets. Is there anything else you see happening over there that I know? Uh, you know, you know better than I do. I don't know the exact stat, but I assume most U.S. investors are underinvested when it comes to uh, international, uh, specifically emerging markets. So, what do you, where do you see them going from here? Yeah. Well, I, I like to qualify my statements usually because everyone loves to talk their book and we have 12 ETFs. Our largest is a long only U.S. stock fund. So I'm speaking directly against my well-being <laughs> when I say <laughs> that uh, there's more opportunity elsewhere. Um, nothing would benefit me more than U.S. stocks going up. Now, it's a value fund. It's called shareholder yield. But anyway, um, but we do have foreign and emerging versions of it. So um uh, so if you look at the valuations, we, we track 45 countries. We actually have an email, free email uh, list. We just sent it out today. 45 countries. It's called the Idea Farm. Uh, valuation metrics across 10-year price to cash flow, earnings, dividend, all these metrics. And we, we take a composite view of the cheapest and most expensive countries in the world. 
And the bad news is the U.S. is one of the most expensive. Um, it's not a crazy bubble, right? Like it's not like it was in the 90s. It's not like where it was at the beginning of the year. It's not like other times, but it's expensive. Um, but the good news is the other 40 some countries are totally reasonable for the most part. I think there's one or two more expensive than the U.S. And I'm blanking on who it is. So I, I apologize. But so U.S. is at 30. Foreign developed is in the high teens. So totally reasonable. Foreign emerging is low teens, which is screaming cheap. Um, and then you break out the individual countries. And so the cheapest country in the world, which I think is uninvestable, probably it's not it's in emerging markets, but no, no one's going to buy it is Egypt. Uh, number two, I think, is Poland. And Poland, you know, this all of Eastern Europe has just been getting um, really hit hard, obviously, due to, to what's going on in, in Ukraine and Russia, as well as all the struggles in Europe with um, with energy, etc. So anyway, uh, a lot cheaper for uh, in, in, in emerging. Now, here's the problem. Two things. One, if U.S. stocks go down 50 percent, there is no scenario where you would expect foreign and emerging to be flat or up, right? Like they're stocks and there's global correlation between the two. Most likely they'll be down just as much, if not more, right? So if you're looking for diversifying investment, this is probably not it. But I think the best analogy to me is sort of the 2000 to 2007 decade where U.S. stocks really struggled in the internet bubble aftermath, but foreign stocks did great. And emerging market in particular really stomped the U.S. that decade. So a value tilt there. Now, one more uh, caveat. Huge percentage of emerging markets is China, right? Some of these indices, you buy emerging markets fund, you're getting like half China. Mm -hmm. And the Russia scenario, you know, I think is that 95% of emerging market funds held Russian stocks, which are now worth zero, or they're marked at zero. They're probably worth something, but they're marked at zero. So you may get an actual free call option there if that market ever <laughs> starts to trade again. But, you know, that's um, unfortunate for emerging market investors, but nothing compared to if something happened with China, right? Because then that's yep. half of, of these allocations. However, and this is what makes markets challenging, but also fun and rewarding, uh, the, the P ratio we track on China, which has been as high as like 60 and as low as 12, which is where it is now. So there's been three periods where China's hit valuations uh, where they are about right now. The other two times preceded huge run ups in, in Chinese stocks. Um, I have no idea how to handicap that. Uh, I will say that our funds that can invest in China have avoided China uh, a huge underweight but have started nibbling this year. So um, you're starting to see some of the value funds pick up Chinese securities this year. Whether that'll be a good idea or bad idea, let's you and I talk again in a year or two, we'll, we'll look. Yeah. <laughs> but historically, emerging markets is a percentage of the equity space. So US is like uh, 55%. Let's just let's round. I, th I think it actually hit 60% at one point. Um, foreign developed is most of the rest and then foreign emerging is like 10%. Um, the average American allocates like 2% to emerging market yeah. stocks. So a huge underweight relative to your comment earlier. So anyway, I let's and just give me what, something positive. I need to go into the. I have to go work out now and I'm pretty depressed. So can you give me something to, to feel good about? Look, um, the takeaway from a lot of what we talked about today is is often like we get into the weeds with an investing stuff um, without like establishing the foundation. So if you were to say, Meb, let's start from scratch, the beginning, like what's important in, in investing? And I'd say the first thing that trumps everything else is um, you have to save in the first place. So how much and when you start saving is more important than anything else. So hopefully we got some 20 year old listeners on here. Um, not everybody is 90, uh, but the decision to start investing, I actually don't think it even matters that much what you invest in, which sounds like total heresy from a portfolio manager. But um, if you just start owning and start investing, that could be real estate, it can be stocks, it can be whatever, right? But just this, this mentality of being an owner um, and then compounding. You know, you see all these compounding charts and, and I gave a speech to a bunch of students and um, Ireland before the pandemic and 
um, but was basically giving this example. I say, look, you know, many of you are getting ready to go on spring break or whatever the equivalent is there and maybe going down to the Mediterranean or somewhere. And how much is that trip going to cost? I don't know. But let's say let's round up and say $1,000. said, or you could put that $1,000 in investing account and in, uh, you know, 25 years compounding at 10%, that's going to be worth 10,000. And in 50 years, it's going to be worth 100,000. How much, uh, you know, are you willing to sacrifice today for your future self? And um, obviously you add, start to add zeros to those numbers and it becomes really interesting quick. And so um, that's the foundation. So being an owner, whatever you want to invest in, if you were to ask me at the beginning, say, Meb, Desert Island, close your eyes, 10 years, what do you invest in? And I think our, our emerging market value strategy, but really any emerging market, that would be my my guess maximum compounding i think you're gonna do double digits in emerging markets um but it's like a close your eyes hold your nose put it away just dollar cost average into it forget about it you know and, and own some yeah so i'm very optimistic and i think if you look at the long history of, of, of investing you know one of my favorite charts is is the s p for the last 120 years and like every year it has whatever crisis you know it's like wars pandemics, um, assassinations, on and on, right? And then yet, I'm rounding 10%, yep. you know, to infinity, right? This log chart that's just yeah. gorgeous. And so, uh, to me, that's the most important. So investing, being an owner mentality, because it also keeps you from spending it all, which, you know, <laughs> anyone's going to go look in their garage and look, take a look around and be like, well, that was money wasted. Um, this is very near and dear to my heart now because we're renovating. So, um, so I, I think that to me is very optimistic. And then, um, and then not spend any time on it. Just put that sucker on autopilot. Let it wear in the background. The magic of compounding, and uh, and then uh, let it go. I love it. I mean, you're speaking. You're speaking to me. I feel so much better right now. I hope everybody out there <laughs> listening does too. Honestly, no. But I'm being serious. It's that's you know. For the average person to try to pick these tops and bottoms, it's not going to work. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's very difficult for professionals to do it, let alone somebody who's a weekend warrior trying to do this stuff. It's it's, it's just too and, hard. And then that's the part, you know, by the way, that's the part, that's that's the entrance cost ticket of being able to compound your money. And, and Buffett and Munger say this, like, look, if you can't sit through 50% declines in Berkshire, you shouldn't own it. Like, it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, Apple, which we talked about earlier, it's had something like a 70% plus decline every decade, you know, and Amazon's like the poster child. <laughs> it's like exactly. one of the biggest companies yeah. in the world yeah. had a 95% decline and multiple 50% declines. Yeah. And so the, the ability to hold and, and put it away and not fret, I think is, is hard, but that's, that's the entrance cost to I being love that, able to man, reap because... the rewards. Yeah, how many people say, boy, I wish I would have bought Amazon in 2000 or 90, late whenever it went public. Well, yeah, all right, let's go back in time. I'll let you buy yeah. it. I guarantee you, you yeah. didn't hold it. So now that's the thing. You would have sold several times along the way, you know, so. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, exactly. I love your thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you're uh, at an undisclosed location as your house gets redone, and hopefully it'll be done very soon for you. But I really appreciate your time. And again, don't forget to check out What's the best way to get the podcast? It just I always listen to it through the apps, but what's the best way? Any of the any of the podcast apps, uh, the Meb Faber show, uh, you can find it or you can go to my blog, mebfaber.com. We got Cambria Funds, Cambria Investments, watch me pick fights on Twitter, just about anywhere. There's not too many Mebs <laughs> in the world, so I'm usually pretty easy to find. Easy to find. Make sure you follow him on Twitter because he's uh, one of the best out there with actually true good information. So Meb, thank you so much again. I appreciate you having me on the show. Hopefully see you again soon. Thanks for having me. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.